All right, so uh, welcome back again to uh, my channel and welcome to uh, my special series on Jewish thinkers in classical German philosophy and German idealism. And today I have a very special guest. I have Dr. Paul W. Franks, who is the Robert F. and Patricia Weiss Professor of Philosophy and Judaic Studies and Professor of Religious Studies and Chair of Philosophy at Yale University. Dr. Frank specializes in Kant, German idealism, post-Kantian analytic philosophy, neo-Kantianism, phenomenology, Jewish philosophy, early modern philosophy, metaphysics, epistemology, and the philosophy of human sciences. In 2005, he published All or Nothing, Systematicity, Transcendental Arguments in Skepticism and German Idealism. This is a wonderful text. One of my first texts that I've read in German idealist uh, literature. It's fantastic. Um, and he also translated and edited with notes and commentary on Franz Rosenzweig's philosophical and theological writings. So welcome, Dr. Franks, um, here today. Thank you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. So the reason for this series um, that I'm doing, uh, a special series on the Jewish thinkers of uh, classical German philosophy and German idealism, is because I've noticed there's not a lot of content on the Jewish thought that was, you know, extremely important to this this uh, period of philosophy, especially in regards to both Mendelssohn um, and Maimon and Rosenzweig and later thinkers like Kassir and even Cohen. So um, uh, with your background um, in both uh, continental philosophy and Jewish studies, I thought you'd be a perfect guest today to speak about uh, Solomon Maimon, who Manfred Frank called the last great philosopher to be discovered. So I was just wondering if maybe you could um, introduce who Solomon Maimon is, maybe his significance and importance to this, this area of thought. Well, first of all, I completely agree with you. I think there's a there's a Jewish dimension to post-Kantian idealism that is sometimes neglected. And it was very central historically. And I think a lot of the concepts and themes remain very important. And also helps to explain why Jewish philosophy, even to this day, rem remains intimately connected to classical German philosophy as well. Um, but let me say something as you as you ask about Maimon's specific significance. Uh, I would say that he's got a threefold significance. First of all, he's one of the really central figures in the transition from Kantianism to post-Kantian idealism. I'll say more about that in a minute. Secondly, he's the founder, somewhat unintentionally, but nevertheless, the founder of post-Kantian Jewish philosophy. And thirdly, he anticipates in many ways themes of analytic philosophy as well. So first of all, then, he, he's a central figure in the transition to post-Kantian idealism, mainly because of his first two books. He wrote an essay on transcendental philosophy, which came out in 1790. And uh, I think we'll talk a bit about his biography in a few minutes, but uh, that came out of a correspondence, not directly between him and Kant, but between Kant and Kant's Jewish student, Marcus Hertz, who had been Kant's student in Königsberg and had returned to Berlin and was a uh, an important member of the community there and a, and a physician. And he had befriended Maimon, who had come from uh, Polish Lithuania. And uh, it was through Hertz that Maimon encountered the Critique of Pure Reason. Maimon then has notes on the book, which get sent to Kant. Kant writes a, a letter which Maimon made famous, saying that no one had understood him or the main problems so well. And then Maimon revises it somewhat into a book that comes out in 1790. To a large extent, what comes out there are two main points. Number one, that Kant has not succeeded in refuting Hume's skepticism. Hume's skepticism is eminently defensible against Kant. Sure, we'll talk about why later on. And number two, if you're looking for a response to Hume's skepticism that would give an account of the possibility of synthetic a priori judgment, 
then you would have to look to Leibniz and Spinoza, to the rationalist tradition, and Kant's solution will not work. And the reason why Kant's solution will not work is fundamentally because of the dualism that Maimon finds at the heart of Kant's view of the of the human mind, a dualism between sensibility and understanding on the one hand, and understanding in relation to reason on the other. So I think Maimon's significance there lies in the first place in that critique of Kant. But secondly, his significance lies in his thought about how the rationalist solution should go. He has a particular version of this account of human knowledge, and it depends on the idea of an infinite intellect. And to a large extent, the influences there on my mind are, lie within the medieval Jewish and Islamic version of Aristotelianism. So he brings that notion of an infinite intellect into play in his account of reason, which is focused largely on mathematical reason. And that too is incredibly influential. So I think two things there. One is that German idealist systems are responding not merely to Hume's original skepticism, but to the beefed up version of it that Maimon has developed in the essay on transcendental philosophy. Secondly, they are at least initially very much involved in um, some version of his appeal to an infinite intellect. Of course, they, they bring lots of variations on that and so on, but Fichte and Schelling in the early days, for example, um, are very clear that, that Maimon is the person who has influenced their, their approach. Um, so that's that's the first significance, I think, of, of, of Maimon. Um, secondly, he's the founder of post-Kantian Jewish philosophy. We could, first of all, he's the first <clears throat> Jewish philosopher to engage with Kant on that level. Kant had other Jewish associates, as I mentioned, people like Marcus Hertz, who was a close student, whom Kant chose to play a role in the defense of his uh, of his dissertation at Königsberg, which is an unusual role for a Jewish student to play. We have to remember that at this time in the 18th century, Jews were not in general allowed to attend university. Uh, they were allowed to attend at best the medical faculty. So it was very unusual for someone like Hertz to become Kant's student. And he, he went back to be a physician. And secondly, they certainly weren't allowed to teach at, at, at universities. Uh, of course, Jews had their own uh, levels, different levels of educational institution. Um, but Maimon, for example, was never able either to attend university or to uh, to teach there. He did attend, very importantly, a gymnasium, a sort of higher level high school uh, in Altona a bit later in his life. Um, in any event, Maimon brings his deep knowledge of rabbinics and Kabbalah into his encounter with Kant. He makes some remarks along the way. And in particular, <clears throat> I think the remarks that he makes about Maimonides and about <clears throat> um, Kabbalistic ways of interpreting certain uh, philosophical ideas played a very influential role. Now, that was through a different work of his, which was mainly the uh, commentary on the first part of Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed. So that that was published in Hebrew as well in 1791. In many ways, it's um it's it, it's from the same period of composition as the essay on transcendental philosophy in 1790. And I think they should be read together. The essay is in German, and the commentary is in is in Hebrew. But they uh, interlock in in many ways. So in uh, among rabbinically educated Jews who mostly didn't read German, it was the commentary on Maimonides' guide that was that was really important, I think, in, in set, laying out uh, some, some fundamental ideas. Thirdly, I would say he anticipates many aspects of analytic philosophy. And I think that has to do with his approach to logic. First of all, Maimon is not satisfied to ask just the question that Kant himself had raised, which is how are synthetic a priori judgments possible? He says, well, what about the other a priori judgments? What about analytic judgments? We can't simply assume that we know how they are possible, as Kant does. Uh, and in asking that question, he's basically asking about the foundations of logic itself. And in his uh, second major German book, he undertakes a, a complete revision of, of logic, which played a very significant role, I think, in, in Fichte's thinking, and ultimately leads to something like Hegel's logic. Whether Hegel read Maimon remains a bit unclear. He doesn't refer to Maimon by name, 
but he does use one of Maimon's terms. Maimon had said that Spinoza was not so much an atheist as an acosmist, and that's a, a, a remark that Hegel repeats without citation. Uh, and I think in, in Maimon's style, to some extent, he's much closer to an analytic philosopher than uh, to a continental philosopher. But he has been influential, for example, also on uh, Jules Deleuze within the, uh, within the continental tradition as well. Thank you for that very detailed answer. That was fantastic. Um, one of one of um, as I was going through his biography, um, there was a Talmudic saying that he enjoyed that he used a lot before his works. Scholars of wisdom have no rest in this world or in the world to come. Found that very profound. I was wondering um, if we could now maybe merge to his biography. Who, yeah. who he was as an individual, how he came to these ideas and, and, and his life, if that's all right. Yeah. So let me say at the outset that Maimon's most read book is his autobiography, which came out in 1792 and 93. But I, I think on the one hand, it's an imp incredibly important source, not only for his life, but for understanding Jewish life in Eastern and, and Western Europe in the late 18th century. But it's also a bit suspect, I would say as well. Um, at least some of the uh, presentation, I would say, is extremely self-serving. And while you might expect that, uh, at the same time, that there's a very specific narrative that Maimon is trying to present. Uh, this is part of a, of a series of autobiographies that were connected to something called the Magazin zur Erfahrungsseelenkunde, sort of a magazine for empirical psychology, if you like. But empirical psychology really meant uh, introspective um, narrative of one's life. It, it wasn't really an academic discipline. And this was a journal that had been started by Carl Philip Moritz. Uh, Maimon eventually became the co-editor. And the stories that are told are very much to do with the fundamental theme of Aufklärung or enlightenment. So the narrative of Maimon's life story, as he presents it, is about going from the darkness and obscurantism of life in Jewish Poland to the enlightenment of life in the West and specifically in, uh, in, in German-speaking lands. And while there's you know, some truth in that, I think that he tends to uh, over-exaggerate the ob obscurantism of life in Jewish Poland in order to make himself look more and more like a sort of self-made man who has achieved his own enlightenment. So there are some stories there that I would be suspicious of. But having having said all that, um, it's, a, it's an interesting read. He doesn't always come across as a very sympathetic person. The way he treats women, especially his own wife, uh, uh, is particularly ugly. Uh, he abandoned his family and um, refused to give his wife a divorce for many years and certainly didn't treat her very well. But in any event, um, it, the book is to some extent modeled, I would say, on Rousseau's um, on Rousseau's work. Um, I would divide Maimon's life into three parts. So the first part being in, in Poland, um, the second part mainly in uh, Berlin and Altona, and then the third part has to do with his encounter with Kant's critique of pure reason and um, his final decade, he died in 1800, his final decade from 1790 to 1800 when he was prolific and published numerous works. Before that he was writing, but none of, the, none of his works were, were published. Um, okay, so starting off then with his life in, in Poland, 1753, he was born in Sukhoviborg, which is a, a small, village near the town of Mir in what is now Belarus. In those days, it was part of the Polish kingdom, which would soon end, soon come to an end when Poland was divided by the great powers of Prussia, uh, the Habsburg Empire and Russia. Uh, and that was something my mom was very concerned about. Poland had been a fantastic refuge for Jewish life. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was an, an enormous European state that had a form of uh, elected monarchy. It promised religious toleration 
and many Jews had found refuge there when all Jews were expelled from Western Europe. Um, however, by the 18th century, things were undergoing severe decline economically and, and politically. The Polish Lithuanian system of government had ceased to function properly. There was a great deal of pressure from the aforementioned great powers and, and things were not going well. So Maimon starts off then in a in a declining, what in Jewish terms would be called Lithuanian uh, area. Um, you know, how these things are uh, described has varied over the years. And in Jewish terms, Lithuania has to do with Lithuanian Jewish culture. And um, he was brought up by a family that was on hard times. It had uh, been wealthy, but like many families in, in Jewish families in Poland, it had a um, um, the, the, the right to ta to um, a form of tax farming of, of a certain region, but it wasn't really looking after the area very well. Things were not working. So he describes this sort of very backwards place. He doesn't describe its former grandeur. No doubt he didn't see that. By the time of his childhood, it's, it's, in, it's in poor shape. Um, and uh, he is given a traditional Jewish education. He doesn't say too much about that beyond the fact that he was educated privately. Uh, nowadays, uh, that uh, area in Lithuania, including the town of Mir itself, is famous for its uh, Talmudic academy that it developed much later in the in the 19th century, or well, not much later, but certainly in the 19th century. But none of that had happened yet. So uh, he's living before the time of the great Lithuanian Jewish development of high-level Talmud study. Uh, but he's educated privately. He is uh, um, a good student. He receives his rabbinic ordination. And accordingly, in accordance with the uh, custom of the time, he's married off at the age of 11 because he's a very eligible bachelor. Um, so that you know, the standard thing was to look for the. If you were rich enough, you would look for the uh, the the best students, the best Talmud student, and try to get him to marry your daughter. That was the basic idea, um, and that means he's married by 1764 when he's only 11, which again was was customary. Um, by the age of uh, 13 or so, he is a, a father. He has a son, and he's starting a family. He resented this later on, um, didn't feel like he had chosen it. And I think that's why he didn't feel so bad about abandoning his family later on. Problematic, though, that is. Um, so he um, goes to notably goes to the town of Meserich, where a new movement that later on would be called the Hasidic movement was was getting underway. And he's the most important contemporaneous historical source for that. He visits the Magid of Meserich, who is a central figure in the development of the Hasidic movement, and he um, describes it, but ultimately comes to think of the Magid as a sort of brilliant charlatan, and he leaves. And he, at some point in his, in his 20s, so in the 1770s, he becomes deeply involved in reading Maimonides, and he wants to read more science. He's also reading Kabbalah, and it's not clear that he sees any conflict between those those two things. Um, but for example, in the second volume of Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed, uh, Maimonides basically axiomatizes Aristotelian physics. And Maimon was extremely interested in finding out what had happened in physics since then. And he describes himself as willing to walk for many, many miles if there was some scholar somewhere who had a copy of a more recent book so he acquires, for example, um, a copy of a book by uh, Sturm, who is a Cartesian physicist, and he tries to understand what's going on in modern physics. But his access to it is very limited. He basically had no secular education. He had a traditional Jewish Talmudic education. Um, he decides that he wants to go to Berlin. Now, if you remember that Berlin is quite far east, so getting, getting there is he's not that big a deal from Lithuania to some extent. Uh, but it's not easy to get into Berlin. And there was, in particular, a uh, a Jewish gatekeeper, in addition to all the other gatekeepers, whose job it was to make sure that the uh, poor from the East did not just flock to Berlin in order to be supported financially 
by the now wealthy Jewish community of Berlin. It's a whole story about how Berlin had become a wealthy Jewish community and they were very close to the king and played various roles in Prussian wars. So there was this group of sort of nouveau riche, um, extremely wealthy people, which was ex extremely unusual. And there must have been a, a, a large stream of the poor trying to get in. So Maimon reports that he, he tried that as well. The gatekeeper asks him uh, what he has with him in his bag. And he says, he's writing a commentary on Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed. This does not impress the gatekeeper. It's like, yeah, we don't need your kind around here. Um, that was probably, first of all, because it seemed like a potentially suspect thing to be doing religiously. Although Maimonides is one of the great Jewish authorities, rabbinically, his philosophical work uh, has long been considered um, potentially problematic and therefore uh, really should only be accessible and to and studied by a, a small elite in private. That would be a sort of standard rabbinic view. Um, and secondly, it didn't seem like Maimon was, was intent on making a living for himself at all, which is true. And that's true for the whole of his life. I mean, he, he, he basically needs a patron because he's not interested in finding another source of livelihood beyond his intellectual work. And he couldn't get a job teaching uh, in, in a university. So that was about it. Um, so the gatekeeper says, you're not coming in. And he goes off. He goes to uh, Posen, which was then still part of Prussia. Later on, uh, under the terms of the uh, division of Prussia, it would become uh, of, of, of Poland, it would become part of Prussia. But right now, it was a, a Polish um, city, and he uh, becomes accepted there for at least for a time, um, teaches uh, Jewish studies and so on, um, writes an important manuscript there, and um, enjoys quite an impor uh, important position as a respected scholar, until he blows that, and this is sort of his general self-destructive pattern, by saying various heretical sounding things um, and getting kicked out. Wow, thank you so much. That that really fills in a lot about his, his life. Um, well, that's the first part. I don't know if you want to ask me about oh, that. Sh we'll sure, sure. If you can, if you, if you'd like to go in deeper, that, that would be great, yes. Well, I can go on with the second part of his life, or I can we can talk more about that. Um, yeah. But you know, he, he wrote all various manuscripts during that time, which um, uh, are only now being being published. In fact, um, so we know some of his interests at that time. But then, in 1780, so he spent about ten years or so, unclear exactly how long, um, in Posen. He goes he goes back to Berlin, and this time, he has a trick. He gets on the post coach, which is not going to be stopped by the gatekeeper, and he gets right into the city and he meets the um, the intellectual elite, which of course was led by Moses Mendelssohn, who, like Maimon, you know, and, and like most uh, Jews in in Berlin, had a, a similar traditional background and, and education. But Mendelssohn had then taught himself, first of all, German. You know, these were all Yiddish speakers at the time, um, and secondly, had acquired a secular education as well as a traditional Jewish education and had become part of the of the German speaking intellectual elite. So that's something that Maimon is really interested in. And for a short time, <clears throat> thanks to Mendelssohn's intercession, he's supported by the community. But he's supposed to be trying to um, get an education about how to make a living. And he's not doing that. And he's also increasingly not leading an observant life He's going to brothels and gambling houses and drinking. And Mendelssohn says, you, you know, we're supporting you. <laughs> this is not not good. Um, and he basically gets kicked out because he refuses to change his, his way of life at that point. So that lasts till 1783. And then he, I think it's at that point that he goes to Altona eventually. He, he's very uh, down. He tries to convert to Christianity, but but tells the priest that um, in letter because his his spoken German wasn't very good, that he means to treat Christianity the same way that he treats Judaism and basically interpret it in a rational way and throw the rest away. Um, and he's rejected. So he's one of the few people who's been rejected for conversion from Judaism to Christianity. He contemplates suicide. He gets admitted to a gymnasium in Altona and uh, he is able to study mathematics and science. And I think that's very 
but it requires some secular education that way. It's also at this point that he had that he takes a last name. Until now, he was known as Shlomo ben Yeshua, Solomon, the, the son of Joshua. Jews mostly didn't have last names, and they only needed to acquire last names for the sake of registering on, on official documents. So now that he is uh, in the gymnasium, he takes the last name Maimon out of homage to his great um, master, Maimonides, and um, comes back via Berlin to... Dessau and eventually Breslau, where he spends some time, returns to Berlin in 1787. And it's then when, through Marcus Hertz, he reads the Critique of Pure Reason, because Kant had sent Hertz a copy. Um, and my one is bowled over and he writes notes uh, on the critique. Hertz is very impressed by Maimon's criticisms. He sends the notes to Kant, who reads them and writes this famous letter saying, how much, you know, how wonderfully Maimon had understood the whole thing and so on. Um, and that leads to the first really major book in German, which is the Versuch, the uh, essay on transcendental philosophy. It's a revised version of his notes. And so it has the feel of a commentary. It sort of goes through the different parts of the Critique of Pure Reason. And it was very influential, as I mentioned before, for his criticism of the dualism at the heart of Kant's view of the mind, and secondly, for its proposal of a solution to the problem of knowledge, which is the appeal to an infinite intellect. Um, and then in 91, he publishes the um, commentary on Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed. And that's through the um, group of basically uh, followers of Mendelssohn who want to go further in spreading enlightenment among the Jews of Eastern Europe. Um, Maimon is not very sympathetic to them. He thinks that this political project that they have of trying to enlighten the masses is, is a non-starter, but they will pay him. So, and he wanted to write a commentary on the critique, anyway, on, on the uh, guide anyway, so he does it. Uh, but he's not really ever, I think, part of that circle, or if, or if he is, it's not for very long. Um, and then he publishes in 93, uh, the attempt at a new logic, um, and so on. But he's looking for sources of, of patronage now. As I said, he's not really interested in studying either to be a pharmacist or a physician, both options that he had open to him. Um, he's not interested in being a private tutor of Talmud at this point in his life, or he had done that much earlier. So when he, when he is given an offer by Graf Kalkreut to be uh, patronized by uh, a, a German nobleman and to live mainly in Siegersdorf in Silesia, quite far from Berlin, he accepts it, even though it means he will have a pretty lonely, solitary existence from now on. Um, so that was in 95, and uh, he was clearly a very heavy drinker, and that is thought to have contributed to his death in 1800. So the third part of his life was the, from 1790 to 1800, and that's when the vast majority of his of his work is published. There are still some important manuscripts from the earlier period, some of which are now um, being published and some of which are lost because of the uh, dispersion of the manuscripts that were kept in Berlin during the war. And we are hopeful that they will still turn up somewhere. So much of um, so much of the post-Kantian thought has, has had a, a very hostile relationship to Judaism. They've had a kind of anti-Judaism. I mean, earlier Kant, later Hegel with his philosophy of, of history. Um, what was Maimon's relation to Judaism? And um, does it play a part in his philosophical apparatus, in his philosophical system, do you think? I think it, it does play a part in his, in his thinking, but almost an inadvertent part. I mean, it was, Judaism was clearly a massive part of Maimon's upbringing and his identity that he could never really get beyond but at the same time he was not committed to uh, uh, um, either the practice or ideas of traditional religion um, and, and yet he didn't as we've seen want to become a, a christian either and accept under those very same terms so he was very isolated um and one of the things that he took away from mendelssohn's book jerusalem is that if Jewish commitment is in the new society to be a matter of freedom of conscience, 
and not of coercion, either by the state or by the religious community's rabbinic power, then he could opt out. <laughs> the problem was that there was nothing for him to opt into. There wasn't, a, there wasn't a secular Jewish society. There wasn't a secular state and so on. Um, so rather like Spinoza, he, he's a bit isolated. At the same time, um, it, he is clearly um, ready to defend Judaism um, against anti, what we might in retrospect call anti-Semitic attacks. So he defends in his uh, in his autobiography um, the 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 ethics and um, uh, general way of life of the Jewish community, uh, its attitude towards marriage, and so on. Um, he defends the Talmud against uh, people who would cast aspersions on it, and, and so on. But I don't, you know, that's sort of almost a um, a merely a current feature of his thinking. He's not that interested in it. Um, it's part. It's who he is. But um, he's not living a Jewish life. He's clearly nostalgic in some ways for the the life of his his youth. Um, and if someone attacks Jewish life, then he'll probably defend it. But it's not his his main interests were clearly very philosophical and intellectual. Um, at the same time, you do see that he couldn't help but be perceived as primarily as a Jew. Um, and uh, if you look at the correspondence about him, whether it's by Kant um, or it's by uh, um, by other figures later on, um, or the accounts of him in histories of German idealism, certainly all the way through the 19th century, they tend to use disparaging anti-Semitic uh, tropes about him. You know, he's too clever for his own good. He's um, achieving credit uh, at the uh, uh, expense of other people's originality and so on. He's a merely derivative person and so on. Yeah, th this is why I wanted to do these. This is what I wanted to do this series with with scholars on these Jewish thinkers because of this kind of this tone, this kind of glaring tone of, this kind of anti-Semitism that's already there. It's prevalent. It's been there since the time. Um, so it's good to get scholars on to discuss the actual thinkers to give us, you know, give us a, a more balanced understanding. Um, what I wanted to ask you next is, um, did Maimon have any relation to the Haskalah or the Jewish Enlightenment? I actually didn't learn about the Jewish Enlightenment until this year, which is quite sad, actually. I was doing my own research on Jewish thinkers of this time in German idealism. I came across it and was completely blown away. And I started doing a whole bunch of research trying to figure out the thinkers and the, the figures. So did Maimon play any part um, in the Haskalah and, and, and what does he think of the Jewish Enlightenment time? So I, I would make some distinctions if we're talking about Jewish Enlightenment. First of all, we know that in, in Europe in general, there isn't only one thing called the Enlightenment. And what, 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 we, what is called the Enlightenment in the West, say in Britain and Holland, uh, is very different from the Aufklärung, shall we say, in Central Europe and the East. Um, enlightenment in the West was very much associated with political liberalism. But in the East, it was uh, it, um, involved with um, somewhat authoritarian uh, monarchs who are trying to impose new ideas from the top and break down the traditional power of the church. So those are two very different things. And I don't think Maimon has anything to do with either of them. <laughs> Within Judaism, I would say uh, there is something slightly different, which is the, the idea, you know, starting around the middle of the 18th century, that traditional European Jewish life has been too intellectually narrow. And this, is, in the first instance, comes from classically trained rabbinic scholars who having focused on Talmud, Kabbalah, and the legal codes, think, well, there's this whole other wealth of, of Jewish literature, which is philosophical, which is literary, and so on, historical, and we've had nothing to do with it, partly because we don't engage with, with the outside culture of the nation amongst whom we're living, and that has to do with... Um, you know, the, the role of, of Christianity, and partly because we we ourselves have become self-policing about it. So the time has come to go back to the golden age of um, Jewish life 
under the um, the most enlightened version of Islamic rule, uh, the time of Maimonides, let's say, although Maimonides had his own problems with some uh, the Almohads who were um, not tolerant of Jews, but he managed to get away eventually to a more tolerant place. And he's in conversation with the great Islamic philosophers and they're all talking Arabic and so on, right? So the time has come, these 18th century rabbinic scholars think, to engage more with the outside world in the first instance, just to read more rabbinic works which are much broader than what we've been looking at. Um, and maybe to even learn the languages of the people around us. So I would say, you know, Mendelssohn in the first instance uh, and his mentors were very much part of that project. And that involved going back to Maimonides. That there were no editions of Maimonides' guide for hundreds of years. And a new one is published uh, by uh, Mendelssohn's teacher and, and rabbi, or, or rather I should say with, with his teacher and rabbi's uh, uh, consent uh, by, by family members. And that becomes very important. And clearly that Maimon is part of that too. Maimon is a classically trained rabbinic scholar who in the first instance wants to go and read Maimonides' guide, which no one's been looking at for several hundred years. He wants to write a commentary on it and he wants to write uh, other commentaries on um, works of the what they thought of as the golden age of rabbinic uh, culture. Um, so that's the first involvement. It's got nothing to do with politics at that point. Then, however, uh, starting around 1782, with the uh, patents of, of tolerance issued by the new Habsburg ruler, there is the, uh, the possibility of a political alliance with Aufklärung in the political sense, which would be the imposition from above of new ideas that would break the traditional religious hierarchy. Uh, now, in the church case, that would be, uh, in, in, in the Christian case, that would be the church uh, in the Jewish case, that would be the power of the rabbis. Some of Mendelssohn's students, but not Mendelssohn himself, do get involved in that project. And insofar as Maimon knows about it, and he is part of that group in Berlin, he rejects it. As I said before, he is, he is paid for a while to write this new commentary on Maimonides, and it's part of this group's project, but they think it's going to enlighten the masses and lead to this big political change he's not interested in that he thinks it's never going to work you're never going to change the masses of eastern europe he's not interested in the political alliance so i think he withdraws from it. now it's that second project that really becomes known probably in the late in the early 19th century as haskalah and that becomes a sort of a translation of enlightenment although the word maskil which just means something like a um, an intelligent person or an intellectual, shall we say, that that's just a standard Hebrew term which was used in the Bible and uh, in rabbinic literature and so on. So when you see that term maskil, you have to really ask whether it means a classical rabbinic scholar who's interested in expanding the range of literature with which and topics with which they deal beyond the traditional Talmudic ones, um, or does it mean someone who's engaged in the political project? In the first instance, Maimon fits the description, in the second, he doesn't. Okay, well, that that cleared up everything. So thank you very much for that. And that's good that we have that out there. Um, I was wondering if we could now talk about um, Maimon's relation with Kant and the essay on transcendental philosophy. Because this is, this is a, an important work when it comes to uh, German idealism and, and classical German philosophy. So I was wondering if maybe you could highlight some of the major themes of the text, not all of them, um, yeah, um, if that's all right. Sure. Well, let's say that the, the central issue for Maimon as it emerges is how Kant measures up against the rationalist tradition of Leibniz and to some extent Spinoza. Um, and Maimon finds Kant extremely interesting and helpful, but also finds that he falls short. So number one, Maimon criticizes Kant's dualistic approach to the human mind which is one of his great innovations. Uh, and number two, he criticizes Kant's solution to the problem of, that arises from that, the problem of, of a certain kind of skepticism about a priori knowledge. And Maimon, at least in, in a, an early version, proposes his own solution to that problem, which is closer to Leibniz and Spinoza, but draws on ideas from Maimonides and the 
uh, Arabic speaking Aristotelian tradition. So when, when we talk about the dual, duality of the mind, uh, I would say that for Kant, uh, understanding as a faculty faces in two different directions. On the one hand, the, the understanding and its categories may and should be employed with respect to intuitions uh, received through human sensibility, which is spatio-temporal in form. To that extent, it gives rise to a kind of finite knowledge, shall we say, which is not really going to ever meet the standards of the rationalist principle of sufficient reason. Uh, on the other hand, the understanding faces, as it were, towards what Kant calls reason, where it precisely does meet the conditions of the principle of sufficient reason, but there are no intuitions whatsoever um, that can uh, help you out there. Kant thinks that without those, you don't have cognition. You merely have ideas, important, but it's not knowledge. Um, and, and so you get a, a, a radical duality with the understanding being tugged in two different directions. And that's part of the, the fate of human reason as Kant describes it, that we're bound to ask questions to which we cannot give at least cognitively satisfying answers. Now, of course, Kant has a complicated answer to that, um, but M Maimon rejects the assumptions behind it. Uh, he, he rejects this duality. He rejects the idea First of all, I think he, I think one of the important things is that he sees exactly where Kant is innovative and he rejects it on those things. So if you want to be a Kantian, it does, this may not convince you, but it may highlight exactly those places where being a Kantian is saying something innovative. And, and in particular, Maimon rejects many places in Kant's thinking where Kant just makes an assumption of something as a fact. Right. So that sensibility gives rise to spatio-temporal intuitions that have a cognitive role that um and that therefore there is a science of geometry who that is completely uh, worked out as it is doesn't stand in need of radical improvement that can deal with the spatio-temporal form of intuition that's a radical kantian innovation right um Maimon says i don't get that at all <laughs> um geometry is a highly imperfect mathematical science it needs radical revision and it needs to become more conceptual. And strikingly, the mathematicians of the 19th and 20th centuries have agreed with Maimon about that and not with Kant. They have not been satisfied with the methods of Euclidean construction. They developed non-Euclidean geometries and they developed, um, uh, shall we say, purely conceptual versions of geometry, uh, fully axiomatized and so on. And that's exactly what Maimon wanted. That's what he thought was demanded. So with respect to the way mathematics was going, my one was clearly right and Kant was clearly wrong. Um, but I think the other big thing that my one rejects there um, is the what, what he thinks is Kant's begging the question against Hume. Right? Kant assumes that we have experience by which he means interconnected. categories should be exclusively mathematical and not dynamic or causal at all. Um, so I think, again, you know, important rejections of fundamental Kantian assumptions, which uh, uh, highlights where Kant is deeply innovative. And what's important there from the point of view of German idealism is that German idealists do not say, OK, we're Kantians, we're going to stand by these assumptions, even though they can't be proven. Um, they say, you know what, you've got a point we're going to have to show how these assumptions of Kant's or some variants of them derive from more fundamental principles. That's not a Kantian approach. Um, it means that those facts are not merely um, features, irreducible features of human experience, but something that is grounded more deeply. Um, and, and that's a response to Maimon, but it leads to a German idealist systematic project that is very different from Kant's. Um, so uh, I've been reading, um, I've been reading the, 
the interaction between Reinhold and, and Schulze and, of course, Beck. And um, they're all looking for a, a kind of an apodictic certainty to metaphysics, or are they looking for a, well, for Reinhold, he's looking for a foundational principle, a fact of consciousness. Yeah. And of course, Schulze is, is, is a skeptic in this one as well. And I think Maimon is also a part of this this kind of a skeptical approach to Kant's project in a sense. Um, how do you think Maimon's work or, or through these letters, he influenced other uh, German idealists um, with this work on um, his his letters to Kant or his 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 notes in the essays on transcendental philosophy? Well, I'd say in the first instance, the systematic project of German idealism, which was pioneered by Reinhold, was a response to this sort of human skepticism. And I think it very quickly became apparent, if not to Reinhold, then at least to Fichte, who was following the whole thing very closely, that Reinhold's immediate response to human skepticism was not going to work. This comes out in, in Maimon's uh, correspondence with Reinhold, which he published. So Reinhold says, I'm going to deal with all of this by deriving everything from a first principle, the principle of consciousness, um, I'm going to derive the fundamental features of the mind that he, that Kant just assumed, and so on. And Reinhold says, well, wait a minute. Um, not only do I not think you actually succeeded in doing this, but even if you did succeed in doing this, so what? Right? That wouldn't prove the, the reality of your system. You would have Your system would have a merely formal perfection if you showed that various assumptions followed from a first principle. What shows that the first principle itself has any reality beyond its function to prove what you want to prove. And Reinhold is completely deaf, at least apparently, in the letters to this remark, and just talks to Maimon in a very condescending way and says, well, you know, if you just thought about it harder, you get my point and that sort of thing. And, and Maimon then publishes without Reinhold's permission uh, this correspondence, making some rude remarks in the, in the, in the footnotes. But I think, to, at least to someone like Fichter, this was not lost at all. Um, you need to do a lot more work, not just derivation from some first principle, um, a lot of work needs to go into showing that there's some reality to the first principle. And it we see in, you know, Fichte gets um, Reinhold's job after Reinhold leaves. Reinhold was the first professor of critical philosophy at University of Jena, thanks to Goethe and others. Um, and then when he leaves, the, uh, the um, until recently quite unknown Fichte is given the job. And he has a little bit of time before he takes up the position. So he starts to rethink Reinhold's project and he engages in those notes uh, very heavily with Maimon's uh, issues. So it's clearly read a lot of Maimon. Later on, um, he was asked to review Maimon's logic. He never completed the review, but it's very clear when you read Fichte's early versions of the Wissenschaft there at Jena that he has read and is continuing to engage with um, Maimon's logic itself. Um, Well, thank you for that. I, I don't want to. I don't want to take too much of your time. We've been. We've been. It's been a, exactly an hour. So, um, thank you so much for coming here for introducing us to Maimon's philosophy and his importance and significance, and also guiding us through not only his life but his philosophical system. So, I want to thank you very much for being a part of this project that I'm kind of collecting together right now. Well, thank you very much. And I, I really appreciate the conversation, but also the project itself, which I think is extremely valuable and, and worthwhile. So thanks so much for doing it. Thank and you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, and I'm I'm, I'm so happy that I that you you were part of this project.